So I saw this tweet from Tom Patterson showing the hand-painted hillshade of the island of Tutuila in American Samoa, and it was painted by Michael Wood in 1980. And he compared that to a digital rendition based on a digital elevation model, so an automated process versus the hand-painted process. Clearly, the hand-painted process is more artful and frankly more beautiful um, and so i thought well gosh let's take a closer look at this and see if we can pull this into a map and tom helpfully provided a link to shaded relief archive which is something that he is spearheaded that takes the beautiful artistic hill shades of cartographers of the past and he's made them available to the public domain very generously in scanned high-res formats. Some of them are geo-referenced, but many of them are not. This one is not, but Tom does say that the relief was drawn from USGS topographic maps, and it's based on a polyconic projection with an American Samoan datum. Let's open up ArcGIS Pro and see if we can get our map at least in this construct, and then we'll pull this in and try to geo-reference it. But first, we'll download this file. So I'll save the link to my data folders. And I have something, I have a folder specifically dedicated to these shaded relief images because they're just so great. Um, Hill shade, shaded relief archive. Saved. And we'll just unzip this. American Samoa wood. Okay. Now I'll open up ArcGIS Pro and figure out what the coordinates are for American Samoa in the first place. So American Samoa, the way I find it is it's just north of this beautiful undersea bathymetric swirl kind of sitting at the, the precipice of that beautiful feature. So here's American Samoa. This is the island. And we'll capture the geographic coordinates. So down here at the bottom, it'll show me my latitude and longitude in decimal degrees. I happen to be using Web Mercator right now. I'm going to soon change that. And the center location, I'd say, is roughly 170.7 west and 14.3 south. So negative 170.7 and negative 14.3. See if I can remember that. Negative 170.7, negative 14.3. Okay. And I'll come into the properties of the map. I'll change the coordinate system. I'll look for something called polyconic. Polyconic is actually a pretty interesting projection. First of all, here it is in its default configuration. Boy, look at how stretched out that is because it's way off on the edge of the earth, according to polyconic defaults. Um, if my kids saw this, they'd laugh. Hee <laughs> hee. Okay. Um, right now, this is centered at zero, zero. We'll just center it to the coordinates of American Samoa, if I can remember them. And it's simple. So we'll right click this and say we'll copy and modify. And the central meridian, which is the longitude, is what was that? Negative 170.7? Oh man, my memory's starting to fade. Uh, now the latitude was negative 14.7. Remember two, maybe three. I don't know. Two. We'll see. Okay. Zoom in. There's, there's the island. Okay. And now we'll add in this beautiful hand created hillshade 
of this island. And when I add it, ArcGIS Pro says, eesh, this is just an image and it doesn't tell me where it's actually supposed to be in the geographic world. It's just a picture, a photograph as far as it's concerned. But that's okay, we're going to fix that. So we'll zoom right to the extent of this image. Now, this image also has insets of two other islands, but these aren't placed geographically in this, in this plate. So we'll just ignore those for now. We'll only uh, georeference this island. So we'll go to uh, an extreme, something that looks pretty geographically distinct, like this tip looks pretty distinct. And we'll go to the imagery tab and I'll choose georeference. And I'm going to add control points. Control points is like putting a pin in a rubber sheet. Boom, boom, boom. And we just line it up with reality. So I'll put a first pin here in this pretty distinct tip of a cove. And then I will just hit the back button on my navigation until it takes me to the previous view, which is the actual geographic location of this island. And I'll drop it right there. Okay. Now, why isn't it showing up? Because it's just tiny. So once more, I'll zoom to the extent of this image. And I'll find another location. Ideally, it's something situated pretty far away. So you have less um, wildness in the warping. So this looks like a pretty decent spot. Choose this right where this ridge line plunges into the sea on the northern edge of the island. I'll navigate back to my geographic location. Find it in reality. And let's see. Go to the appearance. I can. Yeah, that is a really tight georeferencing with only two control points, which is great because Tom provided some information about its underlying projection that it was drawn in. Okay. Um, now to actually save this so that I can really pin it to the earth and stretch it and warp it with any uh, other projections that I want to apply to this image. I have to create some more control points. Um, it's I'm kind of amazed at how well it snapped with just two. Oftentimes that doesn't happen, but this is great. So I'll go back to the georeference tab and I'll just drop in a couple more also at extreme locations for the island. So this, this tip here is a pretty good candidate. And then, mm hmm. And another extreme edge where this peninsula dives into the sea. Oops. And then in reality, put it right there. Okay. So I have four control points. It's looking like it's still lining up really well. I'll save this. And I'll close my georeference tool. Now this is pinned to geographic reality. Now a GIS system knows where to place this image. It's not just a photograph anymore. It's actually a map layer that can be positioned geographically and reprojected, which is a lot of fun. Now I want to blend this hand-drawn hill shade into the background imagery of my map. So here is the world imagery base map from Esri, but look at where I've got two different flight paths joined together and it's, you can see the seam obviously. If I'm going to make a map, this is not an ideal background to use, but you're not totally stuck with that. So let me open up the browser again 
and go to something called Wayback in the Living Atlas. So livingatlas.arcgis.com slash Wayback. And the Wayback tool lets you navigate previous releases of the imagery base map and maybe something in there works better for you for whatever your purposes are. Um, I'll say only show me layers where there have been local changes based on my current view extent and that kind of weeds out a lot of the updates because it's location specific now and it's defaulting to Las Vegas because good heavens lots of stuff happens in Las Vegas over the years when it comes to building new things and having imagery having to be updated. So here's my little swirl in the sea. North of that is American Samoa, beautiful place I've never been to, but I aspire to one day. And then, so let's, let's center this over where we've got that unseemly gap and kind of mouse. Is a mouse over, I get a preview. This, this is okay. It's an improvement. Um, this one isn't so great. Let's go back to 2014. I'll click this one. And this one actually looks stellar. The one before it is pretty cloudy. This looks great. I'm going to go with this. So how do I incorporate it? I'll just click the Learn More button and look at this release, the details for this release. I'm just going to copy this URL. And then in Pro, I can say Add Data from Path. And I'll just paste in this path. And through the wonders of modern science, I now have a map. So I'll get rid of this hybrid reference layer. I can just completely obliterate my current world imagery in favor of this way back world imagery because it looks better. Now I can start playing with the color scheme of this black to white image. Um, by default, Pro will try to balance the the image and do some gamma shifting and, and brightness and contrast and stuff. So let's just put this back to the default, give it a resampling type of cubic so it kind of uh, looks smoother and better. It's just better. Okay, and now I'll open this, <clears throat> the symbology panel for this. And I'm going to get rid of all the whites and uh, light colors so that it'll be transparent and we can see through to the imagery behind it and we'll retain only the shadows. Let's see what that looks like. So I'll uh, open up, this is the default black to white, of course, but I can format this color scheme and say, you are going to be black to black and make this end fully transparent. So I've got shadows that fade into nothing so I can see the underlying imagery below. I'll hit OK. We'll see where we're going. It's a little dark, but immediately, like, oh, yeah, we're seeing some blending going on. So I'll open this, and I'll just push this back. Okay, now we're only painting in in areas of shade. And that's pretty much what I wanted to show you. So I'm taking a hand-drawn hill shade from 1980, and I've geo-referenced it and I am kind of blending it over my existing base map imagery and look how amazingly that lines up and it's just beautiful especially smaller scale hill shading that's done manually is usually just going to be so much better than an automated system um, and you're not stuck with one or the other you can take this and I could bring in an automated version and feather those together however worked best for my map. So just because this was drawn in 1980 and it's frankly a work of art doesn't mean that it uh, can't be a practical tool for you to use in your current mapping. And I think there's a lot of beauty in that, pulling in the work of people from the past into the modern day. So thank you very much to Tom Patterson for all the work that you do to make these available to cartographers of today. And thank you, Michael Wood, for the beautiful work that you made in 1980. Thanks for watching.